introduction. Matt Feynman, it's my pleasure to introduce from IBM, brilliant design innovator, practitioner, and theorist. He has provided, well, he's done, he's done design for 20 years, and before that, he and I have a strange coincidence, I'm both for oil painters, uh, which is kind of weird. Yeah. And, uh, it, it, and Matt uh, has also been developing and working with IBM on their design uh, approach, which is now called Enterprise Design Thinking, which he's going to go into extensively here. Uh, so, please thank you for coming. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me, guys. Um, a little bit about kind of what I do at IBM. So uh, my official title is uh, Program Director for the Design Adoption Framework. And what that is, is it's essentially a framework to help organizations scale a culture of design. Um, it's a response to the design effort that we, uh, we led at IBM. And over time, as we started telling our story about what we were doing and how it was succeeding and some of the lessons we've learned, companies kept coming to our general manager going, um, we want that too. We need help. Uh, can you help us? And so a lot, some of the buried in, in some of the, the deck today is, is um, kind of the roots of what, what I do now with, with companies is help them drive that change. And some of the principles you're going to hear about are kind of part of that framework. So, when Ben asked, uh, asked us to kind of present, it's kind of a hard time really thinking about exactly what would be relevant to everybody in this room because, you know, we're a private enterprise. And so uh, we don't necessarily face uh, exactly the same day to day choices, but we're still a large decentralized organization. We're still filled with people. We have um, a lot of history, over 100 years old. And we have um, a lot of legacy behaviors and culture within our organization that does us, on any given day, it really helps us or it hinders us to responding to like modern, modern challenges. So really it's about operating and developing a culture change at scale. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about our story at IBM over the past six or so years. And really that is, is kind of the root of, of where we are going going forward. We're talking about the practice of enterprise design thinking at a high level. Uh, this is the core of, of the change that we've been doing at IBM, the change of behavior of our employees and ultimately the people we work with and a lot of our clients. And then what it means to scale it, what it means to do design adoption. Uh, what lessons did we learn that we feel are, are extremely translatable to other organizations who are like us? They're big, they need to change, and they need to find a way to do it um, that, that reflects in, and works within their own culture. So, it always, you know, whenever I talk about IBM, I always have to acknowledge that we have a design legacy. Um, design was, at one time, at the core, at the core of our business. I mean, this is our CAO, CEO saying, good design is good business. I mean, it doesn't get any bigger than that when your CEO, the head of your organization, is basically championing what you do. But, you know, times have changed, and uh, we, uh, we kind of lost our way. Uh, IBM's gone through a lot of transformations. What we do, the services we provide, what we make, you know, a lot has changed since 1973. Um, and we, at a, at, a, at a scale level, you know, at a programmatic level, uh, design was not being very well represented in the company. Uh, we did not have the leadership we needed to have. We did not have the formalized practices that we, we have today, and uh, you can see it in our products, you can see it in our services, you can see it in our stock price. So how do we respond to a disruptive market environment? You know, these things have changed quite a bit uh, in the IT space. The users, we have different users who are making the decision to buy our services. They're, they're empowered, it's not just that central IT person who's buying our software. Now, everybody who's using the software is making that decision of whether or not they want to use our products. And if our products aren't great experiences, they don't want to use it. There's new routes to market. There's different, it's not just, um, you know, you have a lot of startup disruption. And there's new economies of scale. So ultimately, so much around us was changing the way we operated, the way we sold, the way we listened to our users and met their needs was changing faster than we were currently structured to respond to effectively. And then we have this, you know, we have, uh, an incremental risk averse culture. So not only is the expectations of our users changing and we're, we're not meeting their expectations as much as we want, but internally we're not built 
to move that fast. Um, and it's, uh, we're thinking in release cycles of a year, two years, three years software, and uh, everyone else in, in the world, no market, is thinking months, weeks, updates daily. So we started a program called IDM Design. And to give like a really fast background uh, of how IBM Design started, uh, our general manager, Phil Gilbert, he was uh, running a, a software company called Lombardi Software. Uh, they did business process <coughs> management software, I think is what it is. Sounds very exciting. Um, but in the market they were competing at, they were getting much higher, I believe it was like NPS scores. They were, they were basically had a reputation of, of software that was a great experience. So I being acquired this company. And then they put, uh, they put Phil in charge of, uh, of, of that division. And at the time, I think we had 40, 44 products. So he, uh, way too many products serving this one space. So he reduced it down to something like four products. And within 18 months, um, I think they doubled the revenue. And they were, uh, uh, the growth was something like two times the growth of the market. So great outsized gain, outsized gain from, from what is expected. And the, uh, around the time that that happened, our new CEO, Jenny Romney, came in. And she could see that in this one area, something was happening. Why is that happening? And Ginny is very much um, a fan of great user experience. And so they looked and said, why is that area succeeding where all these other areas aren't doing so well? And a lot of it was the practices that Phil was enacting, and one of which was design thinking. So, they basically asked him, you know, what would it take to do this for the company? And uh, he had some conditions, but generally it was, um, you need to hire a lot of designers. You need to build a core team. You need to um, kind of make a commitment to design in a way that hasn't been done. And um, they said, yes. And so we started this program in 2012. And the goal of the program is to create a sustainable culture of design and design thinking. At IBM, that was their overall mission. And the keyword there is culture. So, culture is a loaded word. I think uh, if you read any business management book, uh, you know culture ends up kind of being at the top. A lot of teams, people think of culture as ping pong tables and and, uh, and uh, uh, free lunches, but really it's um, you know what is the behavior of people over time. What's the reward structure? What keeps them there? What keeps them engaged? And what does a culture of design and design thinking mean? So those are two different things. And I think one of the interesting things I've noticed in the earlier talk, and probably we'll, we'll go over this in the next couple of days, is the term design. I mean, Mike and I were talking about the design is a loaded word. It's both good and bad. Um, and we differentiate between design and design thinking. So we define design as the discipline and craft of envisioning and creating great human experiences. So the key word there, from my perspective, is craft. Um, this is about designers. This is about you know this core group of people whose focus is doing just this, and they're trained to do just this. So it's not just designers, it's formally trained designers. So at IBM, before this program, we had a lot of people doing the job of design but we hadn't uh, developed a clear rubric around what a formally trained designer is and what levels that they're performing the craft are they meeting that expectation. So we knew that not only do we have to redefine design, we have to define what formally trained design means and what we expect from designers at what level. The design, in a lot of ways, it's about the designers. But design thinking, Design thinking is a bit different. We define it as a collaborative and inclusive way for cross-disciplinary teams to address complex human problems, sorry, complex problems with a human focus. So this is a quite a broader when you think about it. I mean, this is not just about the craft of envisioning great experiences, but it's about collaboration. It's about cross-discipline between different groups of people. It's about a human focus. So this is you know, this is much, much broader. And this is, yes, about designers. Designers, we want our designers to be design thinkers, but it's also the partners those designers work with. 
It's about the stakeholders on whatever they're working on. It's about our clients who we're serving. And ultimately, it's about our users who we are solving problems for. So design thinking, in terms of uh, its relevance, it's a much, much broader group of people who need to understand it, believe in it, and practice it. So again, we're here, and our mission is to create a sustainable culture of design and design thinking at IBM. So the way we did that is a focus on three pillars. Uh, we call them three Ps. It's people, plus practices, plus places, and equals outcomes. And so the idea here is that in order to create a sustainable culture of design at scale, you need to focus on people. So what does that mean? I'm going to dig deep and a little bit on it, but that means do you have the right people? Do you have the right leadership? Um, are they, uh, you have the right makeup of a team? What does a multidisciplinary team mean? And what maybe is the minimum team model for to create a successful outcome? What are they practicing every day? So we got our people, what are we teaching them to do? Uh, have we formalized that and have we socialized that in a way that those people know how to behave and operate when they collaborate? And then where are they doing this? You know, if you have the right people and you have the right practices but you've not created the right environment for them to innovate, then you're also going to struggle. So have you created the places where that are conducive to this new way of working for your new people or your existing people but you have activated them in this new way? And a qualified places is not just physical spaces, it's virtual. It's your, your uh, tools of collaboration and digital. And so the idea is that if you are focusing on people, practices, and places, you are better enabled to basically drive sustainable outcomes over and over again. You better able to do it at scale. So people. Our immediate deficiency that we identified was our ratio of designer to developer, design to engineer. Um, when the CEO asked our general manager, um, what do you need? They did kind of a back of the napkin analysis of how many designers to engineers uh, are the market leaders in design and business. Like, what is their ratio? What is Apple's ratio? What is Google's ratio? And they, they found it was about one to eight, maybe a little bit better than one to eight, but we, our target was basically one designer to eight coders. And the reason we're focusing on designer and coders is uh, we picked uh, software as the business unit where we were going to start this transformation. We didn't go wide to IBM. We picked uh, software for a couple of reasons. Probably one, that is the background for, for business process management, the first real success story. But number two is the growth area of our business, cloud. It's the, pri it's the, you know, the focus of IBM growth is cloud software. So the, the, the decision was made to like start here. So when you have one designer to eight coders and our current ratio is somewhere between one to 60 and one to 80, we need to hire a lot of designers and we need to hire them quickly. The, the goal, I believe, was 1,000 net new designers in five years. <laughs> we are. We did our steady state of about 1,600 professional designers. Um, at the time, I think we had something like 600 and, or 850 people who self-identified as a designer, as a formally trained designer within IBM. And we, uh, before we are, I think, kind of in conjunction with doing this hiring track, we, uh, we created a rubric around what we expect of a designer at IBM. This is, this is, this is great. You're calling yourself a designer. A lot of them were, were developers. A lot of them had different skills. But they were doing the design role. They didn't like to do design role, and so that's great. We're not gonna we're not gonna kick you out. However, this is the standard we're gonna hold you to. You're gonna have to perform at this level. And I believe about two, about a third, somewhere between like a third and a half opted out. They're like, no, I'm not not really a designer. I don't want to be held to that standard. And that's where we came around to that number of about a thousand net new designers. And we've reached a steady state of about sixteen hundred. 
And we hired uh, a lot of these designers in boot camps. And you're seeing one boot camp um, right now here. We hired primarily um, undergraduate and graduate, two thirds, and about a third from industry um, uh, to join the company. And we hired them in batches. So I think the first two boot camps were 40 people each. Um, and subsequent boot camps changed in, in size, but I think we hired, we were running four boot camps a year at our peak. Um, and basically hiring people in batches, activating them for three months in very intense uh, educational. We, we put them together as teams. Um, we train them in design thinking. We have them work on on select pilot projects that the business uh, lines of business would, would create a proposal about some future state of their product that they want to explore. And for six weeks, you'd have a multidisciplinary team right out of college, living, breathing, sleeping together in these rooms, prototyping and playing back what they created to these business executives. Some of these ended up becoming real products uh, that are now in front of users today. And so we would hire these people, these multidisciplinary teams, and we would put them together and for three months. They'd live and breathe this in Austin, and then they would deploy to the business units that ultimately hired them. And so you might have a UX designer which was hired by a Watson team, a visual designer, which was hired by, I don't know, blockchain or whatever. They're all often from div different business units working together. In some way, we're like inculcating them in our culture, and then they get deployed off to the business unit that they're on. But it was a very much of an immersive learning experience. And so some of the things that we also uh, had to develop was, well, what are our designers? You know, what what is the 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 designations we're going to give them. We started with these, user experience, visual design, industrial design, design research. What's well, not up here is front-end developer. Um, we, we, we started out with front-end developer inside the design kind of category and, and kind of sense of kind of it spun them out. We've also expanded this beyond this to like content design, um, design strategy, I think is another one. So we're still growing the um, kind of what we designate as a, a design. Uh, they're all design, but what we designate as a, a skill, a craft that we want them to develop. But on any minimum product team, you're gonna have at least a front-end developer, a user experience designer, a visual designer, and a design researcher. So even on just the design side, you have a multidisciplinary team. And we create career tracks for them. This is also, you know, really important. I'd say one of the things that attracted me to come to IBM was uh, they created something that didn't exist for me at other companies, which was um, essentially a subject matter expert event to track for a designer. So we kind of did band by pay or whatever, but essentially what didn't exist before was a career track for designers. There's a career track for engineers, there's a career track for product managers, many other areas but you didn't have a formalized track that mapped to these other areas. So if you're a designer and you want to have a long career, why would you go there if there's no path for you? The other thing that's important is in corporate, a lot of times the designer, the only way to advance is to take on management responsibilities. Um, very different being a manager than it is a practitioner of your craft. It's a big shift, it's a shift I made in, in, in my career and then uh, was quite overjoyed to have the possibility to move in between those shifts in my career at IBM. So we created a design principle track and the distinguished design and ultimately the IBM fellow. And these are basically your designation around level of scale, level of outcomes you drive. So principle would be like, I think, um, over a whole product line. You know, a distinguished designer would be over a whole portfolio. And if you reach IBM Fellow, of which there's only been like 200, I think, in the history of the company, and then your reach is global. But it's important that, uh, that you have options, that you have formalized recognition and um, ways to review people to advance your career. And you can stay in the company and have a long career uh, and not have to leave to advance. We've been building a management system, um, basically developing leadership levels on the executive level uh, and 
as, as we kind of progressed through the company, you can kind of see what well, we started in product. And so, of course, that is like our most robust area of kind of design management, design leadership. We have the most VPs, distinguished designers and directors. Um, but we're slowly spreading and developing that leadership and subject matter expertise throughout these other areas of the business. So design, you know, when Joe was a key product maker, kind of like a virus, it's slowly and surely spreading out into the company. But we're continually still developing thought leadership around craft within each of these divisions and giving them tools and community across all of these divisions. So these entities are all like their own companies. So they have their own mandates, their own needs, and in some ways their own culture. How do we enable design and that design mindset to gain root and change the way these organizations operate? In a lot of ways, it's from the top down and the bottom up. And actually, I should give this caveat. If you have questions, please throw them out to me or just write them down. We'll, we'll, we'll get to them after just kind of high frame rating you with, with my slides. Um, so practices. Um, this was uh, uh, my focus initially when I came came to the company. I had the pleasure of working on enterprise design thinking, and uh, that was a great way to start my IBM tenure four years ago. So at a very high level, enterprise design thinking is has three principles, um, and it's, again we'll share these slides out later uh, so anyone can can access them. Number one, focus on user outcomes. In an earlier iteration, I, I told this, we talked about, we said it, it was a focus on the user. Because user centricity, those user needs, understanding what the user wants and who they are, um, it was a kind of a foreign concept to an engineering led culture. Um, but as we continue to iterate upon this, we realized, well, it's not just the user, it's the outcome the user wants to achieve that we need to be focused on. So let's be hyper focused on those user outcomes. Um, there is a, a focus on restless reinvention. So you know, what does that mean? It means um, have a maker's mindset, have an iterative mindset that you want to prototype, put something out, learn from it, build something again, never be satisfied with, uh, with the status or, of what you made because you always have to continually be improving it. And then diverse empowered teams. Um, is your team diverse in skill set? Do you have the right roles represented? Is it diverse in mindset or background? Uh, we found that, um, that diversity in a product team, or really any team at IBM, uh, is an incredibly powerful advantage. Um, and are they empowered? Uh, a team that's not empowered to make decisions, to create something, to test it, to, to uh, make changes to that, whatever they've made, if they're not empowered, then they're just, you know, what are they doing? They're, they're not able to uh, really observe, reflect, make anything because they're always having to get permission. So unless they're, unless they're an empowered team, it's not really an effective team. I'm gonna go a bit deeper in enterprise design. Um, so often it would look like this in a workshop. Uh, we have our diverse team, we have our designer, we have a sponsor user, which I'll talk about in a little bit. A product manager, we now call them offering managers. Um, some from ops, some of my team process. We want the whole team working together and collaborating um, and essentially partnering on creating, creating product or service. And this, while it seems obvious to us, is wasn't that obvious as part of the making culture with an IBM before. Some of the guys looking at the back, I don't know what he's doing, but um, we don't label him. Um, so at a high level, this is a framework for team decision making. It's not a delivery process. Um, it's something that, uh, that often people want to make it into a process, but the truth is it can work uh, in, in many different contexts. Uh, it's universal. It's easy to test whether they're using it or not. I'll get into that a little bit. And it's about driving the life of the outcomes at high speed. So it's not really about incremental improvement. It's really about, are you creating an exceptional user experience? Are you customer-centric, iterative, and team-based? So 
it's really about trying to kind of see the entrepreneurial mindset in, inside a larger organization. But it can be done with Agile, with Waterfall. That's been the biggest uh, thing, kind of a uh, yeah, but we get from a lot of people of like, well, this sounds like Agile, and we do Agile, so how is this different? Well, Agile is great about driving speed. Um, how many here are familiar with Agile? Yeah, yeah. Agile is wonderful. And design thinking, is specifically enterprise design thinking, the principles map really well to Agile. It's essentially, um, I like to say, like with Agile, you can get somewhere really, really fast. But with design thinking, it will help you get to the right place for the right person really, really fast. So Agile without enterprise design thinking, a lot of things I think they struggle because, yeah, they're making really fast, but what are you making? Is it really what you need to Some other practices that we that uh, that we have created, um, we created design language. A lot of our products had uh, very dispersed user experiences, so we knew we needed to create some level of um, uh, unity, not uniformity, but unity, to kind of ground these products in uh, a language that creates some consistency for our designers and for our users. Um, and we created a design research practice. Both of these are all like like. Open, you can go to ibm.com slash design. You can see the enterprise design thinking practice. You can see our language. You can see our research practice. It's all open for anybody to, uh, to kind of go through, read, absorb. We're evolving design language to, um, I think it's called Duo, is the new language, which is much more comprehensive design system. But one of the things that was a bit different for IBM is that we created these and we shared them openly. We didn't kind of hide them and put them behind a firewall that you couldn't see. We're sharing as openly as we can our practices so that um, I think one, to signal our investment in this, but number two, uh, I, I believe actually really effective in, in recruitment of people who see the investment we've made in design and we want them to come work with us. And so, Places, um, a lot of IBM's places can look like this. Uh, it doesn't exactly scream collaboration uh, or innovation. Um, and it's uh, there's still plenty of parts of the Austin campus that look like this because we haven't renovated the entire, every piece of real estate. But it's not conducive to uh, <coughs> you know, being agile, that's for sure. So. We built studios that um, that are much more conducive to, to these new practices, so that we can uh, collaborate easily, quickly. We can assemble teams and spaces, and and really just go to work right away, and not feel like the space is inhibiting our collaboration, but it's enabling it. And also embedding like our design leadership in these spaces, so they have access to subject matter experts. They have access to the people that they need to have access to to um, help mentor them. Um, the spaces are designed to be incredibly flexible. So an IBM studio will have all the furniture will be on rollers. Um, any piece of furniture in the studio should be able to be moved by two people who weigh less than 90 pounds, was, was a guideline. Like, you need to be able to redesign and refactor your space instantly because your team may go from 10 to 20 overnight. Your products, uh, maybe moved. Uh, I think I've moved six times, seven times in four years between two floors in my jobs because we're constantly refactoring the space to meet the needs uh, that are changing constantly. We're refactoring our teams. Uh, transparency is another theme. So there's not a single office that's not able to be looked into, not able to be seen through glass, probably not as immediately applicable to this context here. but. Uh, um, in this case, you know, we create secure floors. And uh, it's important to be able to see what other people are working on. And so if you have your teams kind of spreading off the spaces you can look in, you can see what somebody's working on. You can ask a question. Because often people are working on the same problems. They're, they're, they're tackling problems with very similar users. And there's a lot of benefit that can be gained going, how did you do that logging process? That's interesting. Maybe we could just appropriate that for our product. Well, how much time did that save? As well as 
gave people an opportunity just to see what other people were working on. And we created an opportunity for people to move fairly, fairly freely between the product teams. Um, that also increases retention. We'd rather someone leave a team and go to another team with an IBM than leave IBM entirely. So again, you know, cross-pollination, culture of critique, culture of putting something up on the wall, walking away, coming back and finding 20 post-it notes with suggestions, some of which are really good, some of which hurt. <laughs> but that's, you know, that's, that's the benefit. And you'll see, you'll see a difference in fidelity, everything from handwritten to post-it notes, to high fidelity comps of, of user interfaces, and everything is kind of up on the wall. And um, it takes a bit of getting used to it from a designer. I got 20 years experience, but I was not used to this level of openness. And um, I can tell you, when we talk about that feeling of uncomfortableness, like your professors were facing, feeling kind of threatened, or like, it, it, it is very, it, even if you're open to it, it's still an adjustment. It's still an adjustment to um, to a culture of critique. And uh, one thing I think has really helped us is the design of the physical spaces very much helps facilitate that critique. Who are you, 22 year old? <laughs> yes. Yes, yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll get to that a little bit on playback. But yes, it does not just in playback, just every day. You know, a lot of ways everything is open to being challenged, and, um, and that is okay. Um, you know, other things that have kind of propped up in a, in kind of more of the organic cultures developed, um, you know, in their spare time, designers started wanting to create a makerspace and started printmaking. In their spare time, they did, they wanted to create a radio show, so they created a, a DJ and a kind of software that you could listen to music over your computer. Um, what what kind of happened with some of these things though is it kind of bled into our business. So like now on the radio station, we have uh, a programming um, calendar, and there's now uh, things about teaching design, uh, case studies. All of a sudden, business things are coming into what was previously more of just like an out outlet of fun. With the Makerspace, every um, uh, every boot camp that graduated had its own um, uh, piece that was created. And so in a lot of ways, these side projects that the designers would create spawned <coughs> business value, even though it was not intended to do that, it's not really why we were like supporting it, but it just kind of happened organically. Um, I think it's a very interesting thing uh, that again, I'd never experienced in a previous previous job. Today, we have 44 studios around the globe that we would qualify as an IBM, uh, like a design studio, has certain criteria around collaboration space, number of designers, the client facing, both the client and the internal product. There's a certain criteria to become an IBM studio, and a lot of these have modeled what they've learned from the studio built in Austin, the two floors that we initially built, where we kind of prototyped a lot of these ideas. So have we changed? When we're doing all of this, have we had business impact? I'm not gonna answer that, just right now. Uh, I wanna go a little, dive, a little bit deeper on design thinking, because I know I just blew by it really quick, and I could go, I spent an hour just on design thinking, but I wanted to go just a little bit deeper, and we'll come back to how things have really, have really turned out so far. So we talked about the principles, focus on user outcomes, uh, Diverse empowered teams, restless reinvention. But we have two other aspects to enterprise design thinking that we've developed. It's the, the loop and the keys. And this is like, again, you can go to the website, there's a whole lot of stuff written that goes in very much deeper detail about what all these are. But at a high level, we wanted to create a mental model that was extremely rockable, extremely gettable, and that you could boil them down to the most minimal statement and visual you know, cue that we could that makes retaining this, internalizing it, and then practicing it as easy as possible and translatable across the world, across culture. So for our fundamentals, talk about this a little bit. And we have the loop. The loop is um, 
kind of like our mental model. Uh, it has three kind of steps or phases or approaches, whatever you want to call it. Phases is the wrong word, I'll get in trouble for that. You observe, you reflect, and you make. And so at a very base level, right, you observe a problem. You observe something that you're trying to deal with. Uh, you reflect upon that observation. You think about it. Then you make something based on that reflection. Make a prototype, uh, write down drawing, make a post-it note, whatever. And then you go back to observe what you make. You reflect upon it, and you continue to again go through that loop, observing and reflecting and making continually. And you also do it as a team, so we put our multidisciplinary team inside of the loop. So a high-functioning team will be observing, reflecting, and making together. If you were kind of thinking about like a, an agile process or an agile approach, you know, the front end of agile, often you're trying to handle like those larger questions, what are we doing, <coughs> who are we serving, what, we're exploring the space, and as you get closer and closer to start releasing things, all of a sudden the things that you're addressing, your scope starts to narrow and narrow. Well, we, we like to say, you're doing big loops in the front end as a team about the big problem, trying to frame a problem, trying to diverge and converge around solving that problem, and as you move into delivery, you're still observing, reflecting, and making, but you know, once you start making decisions and honing down what you're making, your loops are smaller. And you're, you're, what you're observing, reflecting, and making about is a lot more focused um, as you get into delivery, whether it's you know, software or a product or that sort of thing. You might find something as you're in delivery that totally blows up what you, uh, what you thought was an assumption, and maybe you gotta go right back again and start with a bigger question, but by and large, you're always observing, reflecting, and making, no matter where you are in the delivery process. But not everybody's doing this and doing it well. So I kind of refer to when you're just observing, reflecting, but not making, you're stuck in analysis paralysis. Meaning you're just, you're just in this loop of thinking, but you're not making tangible anything to respond to. So it's really hard to not just continue to it's not analyzing something. And if you reflect and make, but you're not observing what you make in the wild, then you're flying blind. You're operating, but you're operating without some critical information because basically you're not observing your abusers and what they're doing with what you make. And lastly, if you observe and make, but you don't reflect, you're taking orders. Uh, you're just blindly following what your user is telling you to do. And I think all of us to some degree have learned that uh, that sometimes people don't always know what they want. They're not able to articulate why they're happy or unhappy about the quality of the experience. But they'll tell you. They'll certainly tell you. So for a design researcher, if you're not reflecting upon what you're observing and then making something, um, you know, you're, you're, you're failing that user. So again, you want to be observing, reflecting, and making as a team. And what I like about this, we used to do the, the Stanford hexagon model um, in terms of like how we visualize design thinking, and people struggle with that because they viewed it as a waterfall. And so we've tried to refactor it in terms of like a continu continual iterative process. Um, but that, uh, if you're stuck ever trying to solve a problem, one of the easiest things you can do is, what did I do last? What am I doing right now? If the last thing I did was make, go observe what you made. Take it and put it in front of somebody. You know, if I'm reflecting, I'm stuck reflecting, I gotta make something. So I love this because I think it's great to just get somebody unstuck. You don't have to know any of the other design thinking stuff. Just know these three words and know that whatever the last one you did, do the other one. And it'll help get you unstuck. Is deceptively simple. And lastly, I think probably what differentiates enterprise design thinking from other design thinking frameworks the most are the keys. Um, I think the keys are the key to scaling. Uh, we have three keys hills, uh, they're about aligning us across a team. So a hill is a statement of intent that has a who, a what, and a wow. So 
I always butcher this when we try it anyway. Uh, the hill we always use to refer to is uh, Kennedy's uh, speech around going to the moon. So we'll like send a man to the moon and uh, return him safely to the earth uh, within the day. It's a pretty good hill. He's got a who about the man. That's that's our that's who so we're for mankind, the proxy for all of us. What? What are they going to do? We're going to send them to the earth and we're going to bring them back safely. And the lot. We're going to do it in this decade. The beauty of that statement is he doesn't, he doesn't prescribe how to go do any of that. He doesn't say we're going to use a rocket. He doesn't say we're going to be hybrid military and enter enterprise. He doesn't say like how it's going to be fun. He doesn't say any of that. It's a very clear statement of intent. You go figure out how to do it. But I've been very clear who we're doing it for, what we're doing, and why it's, uh, why, you know, we say market differentiating, but why is this not just an expected thing? Why is this just not an easy hill to take? And generally, we craft three and only three hills within any given release. It keeps your team focused and line. Playbacks are what align our teams across time. So we talk about a critique culture and being able to kind of give feedback and not feeling like it's feedback that threatens authority. A playback is what we created to kind of address meeting culture. We have periodic playbacks throughout um, throughout any like kind of release cycle of a product or experience. And there's different kinds of playbacks, but essentially it's a safe place for people to play back what they've built, where they are, what research they have, whatever they're doing, to the stakeholders. And you, anybody can come to a playback, anybody can give feedback in the playback. And uh, the, the idea there is also to keep the uh, playing field as equal as possible in terms of voices within the room. And lastly, sponsor users. So, Sponsor users are really there to keep us aligned with reality. The sponsor user is a user that we have created some sort of relationship with, and they're basically embedded with the product team. They have, they come to the workshop, they come to the playbacks. A great sponsor user on a project or experience will lead the playback. They're basically a stakeholder in whatever you're creating. And so it's not necessarily a sponsor user is going to sit with your team every day because they have their own jobs or their own experiences, but you're basically, they're the proxy for the user. And it's very powerful to have that person in the room, in the meeting, validating your hills, giving feedback on what you've made, because they're who you're solving it for. And you know, without that person in the room, metaphorically, um, it's very easy to kind of get stuck around your own axle and, uh, and start maybe maybe building what you're told to build or building what you want to build versus addressing the need of that user. And so earlier in the loop, I did not reference this, but we were showing not just the multidisciplinary team, but the sponsor users going through the loop with them. They're observing, reflecting, and making with you. So they're, they're a critical element. So kind of at a very high level, you know, the principles, they're, they're there to guide us. And the loop, it's what drives us. And the keys are what align us as a team. At a high level, that's enterprise design thinking. And it's what we do to, to really scale this mindset across, across IBM and across um, our clients as well. We've also put a lot of effort into creating a curriculum to teach this. So we did a lot of enablement in person early on in the first years of the program. We did a lot of boot camps, um, a lot of uh, um, teaching this over two or three days. Uh, and what we figured out was at some point someone did the math, and it would take us something like 28 years to teach the whole company that way. We don't have that kind of time. So we created a digital platform. And we built this not just for us, but we also worked with our client partners. Um, we took this platform external uh, last year. And so there's a, there's a learning journey that we've crafted within this. Uh, we've badged um, across the platform certain levels within design thinking. 
the courses are really built to provide insight. It's about cleaning. It's trying to, to show how design thinking works in multiple contexts, so not just some of the contexts I've been using, like software product team, but more than just that. And we've created these five badges to essentially guide people's journeys, their learning journeys, but also to kind of understand um, an individual skill set within enterprise design thinking. And at a very basic level, a practitioner kind of understands the framework. They understand the, the principles, the loop, the keys. They kind of bought in to practicing this way, but uh, they're fairly new to this. The co-creator is a much, it's a bit next step level of competency. They have delivered an outcome with the team using design thinking, and they've proven that they've done that. So they are more than just a practitioner, they're a practitioner on a team and they've delivered. And, and we've documented that through the learning journey. A coach is someone who's demonstrated that, they, that they've led, led teams to multiple outcomes. And the coaches are kind of, um, we found what we, people that on a successful team, we initially designated them magic people, but we found there were certain kinds of people that the teams that were succeeding or outperforming other teams had certain traits that we kept seeing over and over again. And a lot of that went into the rubric of what we define as a coach. So the coach is you know, the leader of the team. And the advocate and the leader badges are about people kind of creating the conditions for success. If they do this daily, but these folks inspire change. And an advocate is managing those teams, creating the conditions for them to succeed, but they don't necessarily need to be a coach level design figure. They don't even know all the ins and outs. They just need to understand the basic tenets and understand what things they need to do to help that team succeed. And a leader is about doing that at an organizational level. Right? How do I do that so not just one team succeeds, but many teams? My whole org is building a sustainable culture of design. So advocates are No. But generally, in our, our parlance executives. Yeah. So back to that initial question. So uh, some stats to kind of show our progress, talk about our progress. So we recently, about a year ago, came with a Forrester research report about the economic impact of design thinking in IBM. And they found that the teams that were modeling these practices and uh, staffed appropriately, a multidisciplinary team who were modeling enterprise design thinking, they were going faster in market two, two or three times. They reduced design time by a third and development time by three quarters. And the return on investment was like 301%, which is 80% off. It's <coughs> really nice but a massive increase in ROI. And this is by a third party who's basically saying, by our research, the people are doing this are doing extremely well. And why I like, why I really like reduced development time is one of the criticisms we get uh, about design thinking. It slows us down. Well, what's it slowing them down? It's speeding them up. Uh, we have a lot of numbers around growth. Um, again, the, the number of studios, we're now at six years. Um, we developed our practices. I didn't talk in detail about the Hallmark program, but that was the construct by which we scaled the products that got this treatment. Um, basically, it was a set of criteria by which we would apply these practices um, and uh, staff these teams to win. We didn't do a whole company for 300 and some thousand people. So, yeah, a lot of people. So we can't do every product. At that time also, we had something like, how many thousands of products? We're not going to do every product. So over 200 products have gone through the program. And our very first is a formally trained designer reached uh, IBM Hill, with Charlie Hill. Um, our goal was to do that by 2020, and that happened, I believe, last year. So we're ahead of schedule with that. So in a lot of ways, you know, you have people, places, practices, outcomes. Um, the growth has been uh, pretty staggering. We've also badged 152,000 IBMers. We're getting close to half the company and several thousand outside. So it's spreading quickly, um, at least quickly when you think about a large company that's across the, the globe. And you can kind of see like how, how it moved in terms of 
how design started to spread to the company. We started in product, but it kind of as each year has gone, it's just started to grow. Like I said, the virus is starting to spread out within within all the parts of IBM. Had we not, had we tried to do this all of it at once at the start, I don't think it would have succeeded. I think we needed to prototype it in one area, learn, move to the next area, adapt the work for them, learn, and keep moving. And I think, you know, anecdotally, I remember having a conversation with, uh, with one of our, our uh, VPs, Doug Powell. I think he thought, like, you know, if the program had lost funding and maybe, like, died, maybe, like, in 2016, I don't really think it would have lived on, but by last year, maybe by 2017, it kind of felt like we'd spread long and far enough that if, if, if the design program team, the central team that I work for, was told to go away, we're confident design will live on within, within the organization because we've spread so far and we've spread that mindset and created a lot of things that live on and keep iterating upon the balance. A lot of things that are created now, they're not coming from our team, they're coming from other teams and they're creating it for themselves. So some lessons that we feel helps to widespread adoption and applies the context outside of just IBM. You should phase your implementation. So this is a hypothetical, you know, years or whatever. But essentially, a good idea is when you're starting it up is to deliver outcomes. Start with a few projects. More than just one. We started with seven. Call them signature projects for Walmart. We learned a lot from that seven. I think, uh, what did I say, maybe like one or two failed, flat out failed. Uh, two or three were moderate successes and two were amazing successes. And we learned a lot from those, um, one of which was the ones that failed, the teams were great. What they found was is their executives didn't support them. They, they were like, we'll never let us do this. And so that's part of what ended up creating a whole executive training program that ended up being the advocate level badge. We have an advocate course for that because you can't have a great multidisciplinary team if the management level above them does not support them, then they will fail. So you'll learn a lot from that startup phase, but you're also trying to deliver, you need to deliver immediate outcomes, not just a training program. So the two programs that failed without the executive uh, support, were they re looked at later with executive support? to see if they would become a success with executive support? I'm not sure if those ended up, I don't know the specific business units. They spread it across multiple units. It wasn't just software. I mean, someone was like, it's an old product, it's a new product or whatever. So I don't know if they went back and like relaunched those projects again, but those executives were ones that ultimately weren't gonna buy in and you were gonna move on, or there were people that went back and did it again with them. I don't think I have an idea. Yeah. yeah. So the, the, the key thing about the Hallmark program where those 200 uh, projects came through, it was opt-in. You had to apply to get in, you had to agree to criteria, i.e. practice this way. Uh, one of the levers we had is we hired those designers, uh, we would give them the designers, the designers would report into them, but we would pay for them for about a year. But if they didn't, Work in that way, didn't support the team, we had the right to pull that team and apply them to another product. Um, I think that only happened a couple times, but making it opt in was extremely valuable from a, um, you know, you're not being forced to do something. You're, you're, and basically, part of what getting those initial outcomes is great is then you socialize that outcome, how great that product was, and you make, well, I want in that Hallmark program, I want my, my team, or their SVPs would say, why isn't your product, why don't you have one of your products in the Hallmark? I'm hearing great things about it. So there's certain aspects there that are um, important, I think from a social proof standpoint, but also just from a, people don't like to be forced to do change efforts. So if they feel like they're opting in, they're a lot more, more apt to do it. In the second phase, you and your scaling. I think we went from seven projects to 20 to 40 to, you know, 100, I think, at the, at the highest state or whatever, but you can't go all the way to full speed right away. You're scaling your outcomes, and then basically you're probably where we're at right now, which is developing a steady state. You're a lot more self-sustaining. Um, 
we're not hiring tons and tons of designers and boot camps. We're now kind of dealing, I think, with natural turnover and now developing those career tracks further. So we retain the people that have we've built equity with, we invested in, they've invested in us. Um, you have a plan, but you adapt. So what are the metrics that you're measuring? One thing we didn't do early on and do over again, we would, is we only started measuring that from motor score and PS um, a few years ago. We didn't start measuring that right away. And so I think managing which metrics uh, is important to you, I think is really, really valuable. One thing we did is you know, we wanted to manage, manage team health and adoption of design thinking as part of what the badging system came about. We need to be able to track people's level. Matt, was the internal NPS like whether people would prefer other pe their friends or peers or colleagues or whatever to get that training or? No, it was product NPS. So basically when our users, like once the products, once the teams are like staffed, practicing design thinking, are the products experience basically improving or not? And so, you know, you know the full numbers, but we've seen overall something like a, a 20, 40 point jump in NPS, which is massive for all these products. But we didn't do that right away. Um, a lot of what we were measuring right away, frankly, was program metrics of growth, not uh, experience metrics to our end users and the output of what we were making. Probably because we were just so focused on just going, um, because it was so much work. Um, you know, they ask her about, of outcomes, right? You need some quick wins to be able to socialize, then those wins and the growth rate need to increase as the program investment increases because, right, you're investing more and you need to drive better outcomes. And then uh, this one is key, you know, uh, for, for us was reorging continually within a, within a program team. Uh, if something wasn't working, our GM would have no problem just killing it, move on to the next thing, and reprioritizing the team. Um, that's a good bit of getting used to, too. And then, you know, again, you're starting in house, but you want to transition to where this will survive without your continued leadership. Um, Scanning requires a universal mindset, like a global approach from the start, even though you're maybe starting within a team or a division, you're starting small, but you want to have that mindset of what it might take to do this for the entire organization. Um, you're not just training the team, you're training the organization, so then you need to think about how the management system works and how you can influence that. And then I think uh, uh, comms might be like the most underappreciated aspect of the program is, is we had a massive investment in communications. So everything from uh, our general manager meeting with executives periodically, having uh, periodic meetings with our CEO about the health of the program, um, generating external press for what we were doing, creating recording playbacks, making that open to anybody, uh, having a lot of this communication about what you were doing, why you're doing it, and socializing that as much as possible was really, really valuable for us. Really valuable. Um, I mean, even on the team, I could, anybody with an IBM could go and lead the readout of the, his whole team's meeting. You go find it for their Friday meeting and you could read what they went through, what the leadership was talking about, what they were reporting on, and you download the decks. That was also pretty unusual for corporate. Um, I think this one's a bit of a, put an asterisk by, uh, by this one, but start with the most urgent area of business and grow from there. So don't pick the safe projects, pick projects that have real value. You pick something that's safe and not really important, it's just kind of a pet project. It's not something that I think has the right level of pressure. Uh, right level of what uh, something at stake. Um, this middle one is for the asterisk, enable business owners to decide where to invest. I think that was right for us. Um, we're doing a transformation with another company and they were like, no, that would be a disaster. So I think that one for us is, right, you're giving them some agency, but also that may not work in a good organization. They may not make, the right, make a decision, they don't know what's the best place to invest. And again, being over communicating is necessary. So kind of come back full circle. This is the core of design adoption, and this is the core of what worked at IBM is, and why it's become a sustainable culture of design, is we're constantly focused on people, we're constantly focused on the practices. We have teaching those, iterating upon them, 
uh, building places, revising them, um, and basically making sure that we're not shortchanging any one of those three areas. And that's how we continue to drive outcomes. That's pretty much it. Questions? Um, when the slide that showed observe reflect make popped up, a lot of us got excited with that word reflect. And um, I was wondering if you could just briefly touch on how how either you teach the folks to reflect, or is there is there one method? Or um, I would say go back to this and then probably the design research practice is a great. Uh, did they go past it? Okay. Okay. Well, um, we'll put the loop on. So, um, I mean, I think design research is all about observing, observing, reflecting in all ways. I mean, of course, you're making, you're, you're helping inform the product that's made, or you're kind of playing back your insights from, from that research and that you're making. But we have a whole practice around two types of researchers. I think one's the guide, and probably the other one is, but essentially, we build a practice around someone who's a very competent and well-versed researcher and someone who's doing research but maybe isn't technically a design researcher. And, and so that's open to anybody who wants to develop that capability. Because often you, know, you may have a team that doesn't have a researcher, you have to conduct research. That's always seems to be the thing that you want a shortcut. But it's like, why would you invest all this time and money in making something and you're not talking to your users? You're not putting something in front of them and testing with them. So I think, you know, Reflection is key is a key part of, of design research. Um, does that sort of answer your question, or is that going to go with scans a little bit? Uh, one of the things I found interesting. Who press the button so everyone can get it? Oh, sorry. <laughs> one of the things I found interesting when I started was you could replace those three words with, um, you know, um, observe is research, reflect. Strategy, make is prototype, right? Um, and one of the things Matt left out is you can jump into that loop anywhere. There's no wrong place to start. I'm I'm a maker. I, I'm I'm the first getting to start making things. Uh, um, shoot from the hip. Um, but what's important is I have to learn from what I made. It's not always right. Um, and that's where the loop comes in. You can jump in at every. I think that this model supports almost any organization you think about it in terms of research strategy and prototype. Um, um, it, it's very simple to understand without a lot of heavy concepts. Yeah. My default is reflect. And I start there all the time. I overthink. And so my the natural inclination is I need someone like Mike to force me to make something. <laughs> you know, otherwise <coughs> well, I'll just and write and you know, not put something in front of the user. Questions. Go ahead, go ahead, Nick. Uh, do you have any data on employee retention when you look at comp groups between individuals who've gone through training at certain badge levels or whatever, or versus groups who haven't yet? Yeah, um, I don't have the specific data. I know our retention rate is higher than the industry average. So I know we have, I mean, there's natural retention, uh, natural uh, attrition. Um, especially when uh, a healthy amount of people just win their first gig, their first job. Um, but when I talk to the talent team, um, <coughs> that we're still trending above industry standards for, for designers and retention and tech. But were you before or, or oh. only post intervention? In I, I don't know. Well, we weren't tracking before because one thing I left out, there's a lot I left out, but we created our own shadow HR team to hire all those designers hired all those designers, HR, we did not feel was really up to the task to hire designers um, because they're hiring for, you know, the whole and all processes. So we created our own HR team to hire those thousand designers, then onboard them, then help develop the career track. We've since disbanded that group, and a lot of those designers have moved into HR, and now HR has a design capability. So we've actually seeded corporate HR with a lot of what we learned from our own little piloted HR. So, um, before that group was, I don't know what those numbers were. Um, you know, we're recording, so I probably shouldn't say what I think. But I, I, I think uh, 
I think I would bet you that um, uh, that our retention was probably at where we are below before. Um, but our design capability is so much more robust now that it's almost apples and oranges. I don't know if it would be effective comparison. Yeah. Good question. Matt, uh, we've heard previously in the, in the last lecture uh, about design disasters or, or the those who are or what I call Gandalf the Greys uh, with design. You shall not pass. You shall not do that here, and I will stop you. Uh, how has IBM approached that, particularly if it was somebody who is, say, a, a sponsor or a senior leader, and, and they just said, look, I, I don't believe in this, I don't want to do it, I don't like the change, and I'm going to fight you? Um, in, in the context of the Hallmark program, we didn't work with it. I mean, you make an opt-in, um, you know, I think they called it the no-asshole rule, basically. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of people who are skeptics who we were able to convert a lot of times through those initial boot camps. And the whole other story I can talk about like how we engineer those boot camps to kind of change people's perspectives by the end who were very resistant to the front, the front end. A lot were. It was like, oh, it's a new fad, design thinking. Um, but by and large, if you make the engagement with your program opt in, then a lot of those people will self select out. And then perhaps if someone has pressure to put their put their teams in by someone above them who's opted in, um, their criteria and having the leverage to pull our teams if we needed to, because we were managing the team health, uh, was also a very important lever for us to be able to say, if you're, if you're actively sabotaging this effort, you're not going to get our resources. And we're going to deploy them where we are. Because we leave them, people are being miserable, they'll leave the company, the product will suck, so then less people will hire IBM or use IBM. So, why waste those precious resources? It would be a failure for everybody. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, I don't know if that worked perfectly, but that's the only how we dealt with it. I would add that support for the opposite. If somebody pushes back a me in a workshop, even if they're an idea fellow, I can say, look, I understand that you have to go take that out with Mark Foster, who's head of idea services, because he's saying this is how we work now. Right? So that, that, Having like from a CEO level and, and business unit leaders on the different business units, and we have that top level clearance saying that this is how we work moving forward, I think we all need the initial meetings. From what I've heard, generally, if it's generally we've not had problems getting the top line in or from the bottom, it's the middle. And so the whole effort with the program is essentially to, to seed influence from the top down, the bottom up to influence the middle. Um, where a lot of change efforts get stuck. You know, a lot of people who are really on the hook to make something. They're really on the hook to do. But, and I, I feel for a lot of those people because, you know, by and large, perhaps the behaviors that they did to get where they got did work. But if circumstances are changing and they're resistant to change, that becomes really problematic. Going in, uh, going in, did you guys have a change management um, strategy? So, Yes, part of that is people, practices, and places. Part of that's the Hallmark program and um, uh, the comms aspect with, with a general manager, kind of how he's doing that. I mean, that I mean, that essentially is the strategy. You focus on the growth area, the business cloud. You knew you had to ramp up people, you had to develop those people, build spaces for people to work, clear roadblocks. I think I was thinking more about your culture changing the culture of the company. So I think you add all that up, that becomes your culture. Especially, my personal bias, I think the practice of enterprise design thinking and communicating and socializing that does change culture. Because you're changing behavior. And if you're ultimately changing behavior, then the culture starts to change. It's not just about uh, cool maker spaces and, and, and young people. It's, uh, and I've seen this, I spent the last two years in, in global business with, with with Mike, so I'm, I'm working two areas at IBM, and I can see where like that culture change and shift happens, especially to long-time IBMers, even the salespeople, which is really interesting how they start to become more user-centered. Um, you generally only change your behavior through doing, and so most of the behavior change that I see is people who are practicing enterprise design thinking and seeing an outcome that was different than before, not just being taught it. 
they have to do it. That's why the outcomes is like throughout this whole deck. It's like you gotta be doing it, you gotta be making something, and uh, ultimately you gotta be showing that value to the business, not just being training effort. I think training is great, but it's only part of the picture uh, from our perspective. Yeah, part of that is based on the statistics that you were showing here that you really don't have a whole lot to make, so you're an ideal. It seems to be with Not a large number of people and no, no, that many locations in that many countries with those sort of outcomes and things like that. I can't imagine the naysayers would be tolerated in the culture that is adopted. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's. I mean, it, yeah. I think when you're when you're as big as we are, I mean, every country is. I think isn't every country essentially its own corporation. So, I mean, think of all the cultures, languages. Um, uh, as I work with different studios who are, you know, they all have slightly different cultures as we're trying to, 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 to help teach and, and give them tools to, to do. Um, I think, you know, you see from the badging statistics, we're still only uh, getting close to halfway through the, through the company and we're in year six. So I came in four years ago. So I would bet you that, you know, at the start, 2012, there was a lot of skepticism. I think skepticism is really fading. Um, and I think, you know, I think it just continues to take time. But yeah, I, I, I wish I could, I wish I was here in 2012 and I could speak to what it was like then. I had probably a better perspective because it kind of came in a couple of years in and the, and the cars going down the road. You had mentioned that a third to a half. Initially, uh, self-identified de designers opted out once you formalized what those roles and responsibilities were. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate on what some of those roles and responsibilities were that turned some of those folks off? Yeah, so in our career track, we have essentially like um, what it means to a couple things. What is practice like for user experience design? Like there's a criteria can't read it off the top of my head, but like essentially, you know, what what you are doing, like, you know, creating effective prototypes or like, you know, able to understand, um, you know, human behavior and, and um, you know, have a, a working knowledge of kind of user interface best practices, things like that, I'm totally butchering it. But essentially, at each band as you go up, your uh, level of crack has been defined as to what your knowledge base needs to be, and in the same track, there's like a level of influence um, that that is going on. Like, what is your scale of influence? Is it to your peer, to your team, to your uh, product, to your division? And then there's the outcomes you're driving. The scale of your outcomes needs to needs to grow as well. So that um, has continued to kind of be defined. Some of it's just what you're doing every day. Um, so, I mean, we have that rubric built out, um, and that's something that, that, uh, uh, that I think, essentially, I think there's a lot of people who liked to do it, but they really didn't possess the requisite skills to do it in the high enough level. And the other thing is, is now that we're building language, you know, we, there's also, you can, some things initially just pass the high test, you know? You're looking at it. What does that product look like? Does that look like it's a great experience when you can get into it and and uh, use it? Is it at the same standard that these other teams have established? Um, so, yeah, at the top of my head, it's been a while since I've looked at that rubric, um, but uh, there's at least ten to twenty things for each category uh, of uh, what you practice, what your level of influence, and what your outcomes are at each band that you need to be doing. So you need to demonstrate that to move up as well. And so what we have is called the portfolio experiences. So for the distinguished designer, the fellow, and the design principal, you have to create a package to show that you're already operating at that level. And now we're starting to do what's called portfolio experiences for the level below that too, so that you know, you're proving that you're at that level already and you're ready to have to move up. Um, but sorry to answer your question, yeah. Matt, thanks much for coming today. This has been a fantastic presentation. Um, what was the catalyst story for the, how did the bureaucracy realize the need to change uh, the organization in the first place? Um, I think, yeah, that's, uh, I, again, our, our, our general manager will be able to answer that really good because he is a catalyst. 
Um, but I think part of it is the changeover with the CEO coming in. Um, I think the other thing is, is, you know, as a company, we weren't performing well. We still need to perform better financially. Um, I think we were seeing, I think the other catalyst is, because like Phil says this, he's a startup guy. I mean, he would have just left the company and gone done with the startup. I mean, this opportunity didn't kind of just land and be added to it. So I think you have new leadership, which has a focus on user experience as a key differentiator. And then you kind of have perhaps something of an awareness of the value of design rising a little bit. And I think you have a leader who's already demonstrated in his business unit that he's used these practices and driven outcomes. So I want to replicate what's working there and I want to do it at scale. And I got to move fast because, you know, we need to continue to keep changing. So I think it's like a combination of enough pressure to change the ship and move the ship where it's going, but not so much that we're drowning, but not that we're doing so well that no one's motivated to change. <coughs> So I, I sometimes feel like, especially when I talk to other companies, I think you have a sweet spot of, of external and internal pressure to change. Um, because you also need to have the resources to make the investment to do it. Um, I think it's like a combination of things. I mean, you've been here much longer than me. Uh, I don't know if you have any insight being here. Well, I think we're primarily driven by those outcomes. I mean, there were insufficient, I and mean, actually the time to innovate was getting too long. I mean, the market is at, was outpacing us at the point of time in innovation. I think we've really um, improved dramatically on that one in terms of driving innovation into market. I think this goes back to the culture. I mean, a, a great quote from our leader is that we want to change culture through outcomes. We don't want to change outcomes through culture because in that case, you're going to this kind of bully kind of culture, education, things like that. No, it's all about how did you drive you change the culture through different outcomes. Uh, and I think that's really what was needed at the point in time. Yeah. Including the drive for much faster innovation and shorter go to go to market. Any questions? Yeah. So I, I'm of the opinion that teaching design is really hard work in the sense that not everybody learns it at the same pace, not yeah. everybody's ready for sort of different levels of sophistication, et cetera, with, with the principles, et cetera, and the toolkit. Um, how the hell do you do it through a self-guided app? Uh, you don't do it alone, you bet. So, the, uh, we have different ways, I mean, we have both in-person and, and digital activation. Uh, the practitioner course is generally a fairly self-guided, it's more of an exposure. It's like I said, you can spell it, you can spell design thinking to get through it. Um, but you can't achieve, finish the co-creator course without it's tied to a project. So you're actually working completing the project as you're going through the co-creator course. And then you're tying your, your, your application to co-creator to the product you're working on. And then coach is a much, much broader kind of, uh, we actually activate coaches through more mentorship because that's a path that like, you know, in, in realistic terms, it's a year to two years to get to be a coach level design figure, to be honest with you. It, it, it's, it takes a long time to get back to it. There's some people maybe who come to it with already the innate skills and abilities, they just haven't been recognized. Those can be more and more accelerated. But, you know, almost all of that, especially co creator approach, you're learning through doing and you're demonstrating that you've <coughs> done to get that recognition. So it's, it's a recognition of competency, not an award. Uh, kind of, or, you know, it, it's, um, I think the other thing is it's, uh, I say this like advocate course is currently the advocate is currently in person uh we'll probably start to hybridize in person and, and digital so it's except for practitioner it's all continually tied toward project outcomes but yes it is very hard to to, to, to teach this up and it's not just an app i mean think of it more like distance learning yeah. it, there's a lot of robust video content those badging systems, there's takeaway work, there's there's interactive experiences where you're working via an app called Mural with other teams. Like there's a lot of different aspects to it. Um, it's not a simple passive app. Yeah, uh, it, it's tricky. Either. What's uh, not in there? Again, this is kind of a drive-by the program. Uh, is uh, chapters. So we built a robust um, chapter network within within IBM. 
and you can see more lines about in your own chapters. And that's essentially a community. They help kind of support people's uh, development in the craft. And like the chapter heads will actually review uh, some of the applications of the coaches and mentor people on the coach path. So it's very much a blend of digital and in-person interaction. Um, and we're still, you know, learning like how to do that and, and just iterating upon it. Um, but yeah, digital, we didn't go to that until several years in the program because we just realized there's no way we're going to scale it fast enough. Um, but it'll never be completely just digital. I have a question. Um, reflection on the whole system. Um, you know, there's a there's a theory that uh, bureaucratization occurs no matter what, <laughs> and uh, it's possibly you could become uh, this whole system could become itself, you know, concrete yeah. to the point where, well, no, you're not following the model. You know, you're, you're doing something different here. You know. mm -hmm. um, has IBM thought about that and says that how do we keep this fresh without doing what Apple did? Remember what Apple did? They started off very creative and then they became very bureaucratic and almost went out of business. Yeah. yeah. Um, so they lost they lost the uh, momentum of their yeah. creativity. Um, you're trying to garner this now, but I'm also seeing a lot of structure now being put on it, right? Yeah. So the more structure, the more the less you are. Getting a, you're getting away from the art and going more to the science. Yeah. So how do you address that? I think, um, I mean, some of the structure, there's a lot of structure that was there that's just continually being degraded. So you had to have structure to create a boot camp, to hire people, to create a Hallmark program, to decide what practices you want to create. And then this is the fourth iteration of enterprise design thinking about you know, So we didn't get this right out of the gate. They went and <coughs> to it all the Stanford and all the other models and iterated upon the Stanford model, I believe. So both practices are continually being iterated upon. The um, the rubrics around careers and developments are continuing to be iterated upon. Um, we're growing our design management system. We're now just putting some people in charge of kind of kind of more of that that uh, executive leadership for design is now a focus. The core team that I'm on, they're basically doing something different every six to 12 months. They're not working on the same thing. So they're constantly reprioritizing people to figure out where we need to kind of take the next step. So I think a lot of that comes from our general manager's willingness to never kind of get satisfied with anything. He just kind of always keeps us on our toes. Um, and I think there's a balance between having that vision, which is still culture of design and design thinking, but not being particularly tied to a prescriptive, uh, we have to do it this way. I mean, I think people practice as places, it's a, it's a, it's guide, guide, it's guardrails, but it's pretty broad. Think about it, it's just, you know. I would add, uh, to me, people who practice places, it's very top level. And one of the things that Matt did not how to get into, we also have how we work day in day out. Like when we talk about enterprise and think in the framework, we have exercises that we work that everybody uses in a workshop to if we're trying to achieve alignment or if we're trying to exercise empathy or if we're trying to create a two beat scenario. We have standard exercises that are part of as you move up the rubric, you, you're able to teach those exercises and use them in workshops after that's what I do as a full time facilitator to help people work through <coughs> hard problems throughout the organization. But it, enterprise design thinking actually isn't becoming hardened and, and uh, uh, stagnant. It's actually evolving past that. So now it's more about uh, a garage approach to market in which design thinking is just a small piece of the front end uh, of the innovation. And, and, and there are new processes that have been rolled out throughout the organization as how we work, we're design thinking that the, the front end of that, but that it's hardened frameworks and processes that it can pass it to, to get the other parts of the organization more consistent and, and more in line with uh, throughout the development process. I think that we're also building additional, like, I don't know if it's technical practice, but like Adam Cotler, who I worked for, who developed this um, with Charlie Hill, He's now designed uh, design for artificial intelligence. 
And so he's building it based on the whole practice of what it means to design for AI. And so we're continuing to kind of identify areas of emphasis to continue to build a capability for that, like, they wouldn't have really thought about that five years ago because this is way more important. Getting the whole company to work in a new way is a higher priority than that right now. But AI is becoming so important right now. It's like, what does it mean to design for AI? What are the ethics involved for that? I design it to inter interact with you to enable you and not scare the living daylights out of you. You know, not, not creep by you or whatever. You know, like, there's a lot of things in AI that scare a lot of people. So, like, you know, it's continuing to evolve. I think there's a balance. I kind of get where you're getting at because like, I feel like this when people are out doing the right thinking and doing it badly, I'm always in two minds of like, is it better that they're embracing it but maybe not fully doing it as well as I would like versus not doing it at all? And so there's kind of like, I think a constant tug of war between governance and, and letting it to be uh, a certain amount of self-driven chaos. And I think it's just, you're reading the reading it moment to moment. Um, and I think they make a conscious decision about what things they can control and what things they just need to not worry about because we'll never be able to control that. Um, maybe it's more like influence versus governance. I'm trying to figure out which one are you focusing on for that particular problem. Um, but yeah, I think it's a balance. I think, really, I think hopefully we won't get to that point uh, where we're, you know, Eating so much of our own cooking that we can challenge it. Yeah.